Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we get underway today, I wanted to start with a few words about the next tranche of health investments from the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund. It's clear that the world is going to be living with the ongoing impact of COVID-19 for quite some time. The virus is spreading at pace internationally, with a record number of new cases in recent days. New Zealand is in an enviable position. Thanks to the decision to go hard and go early, and thanks to the sacrifices that New Zealand has made during the lockdown, we have no evidence of community transmission here in New Zealand. Our economy has largely reopened, and we have relatively re few restrictions in place on our daily lives. But we cannot take anything for granted. That's why we're putting so much effort into our management at the border and to our managed isolation and quarantine facilities to keep the virus at bay and to protect the gains that we have all made together. That's why today I'm announcing a range of investments to strengthen the, our capacity to respond to COVID-19 and ensure that New Zealanders continue to get the care and support that they need from our health system. One area where the pandemic has had an immediate impact is the global supply for medicines, uh, medical devices and PPE. For example, to prepare for a potential, a potential COVID-19 related increase in treatment of patients in ICU, Pharmac secured additional stock of a number of medicines. These medicines have more than doubled in price since COVID-19 began. Disruption to the global supply chain is expected to continue for some time, and it's not realistic to think that Pharmac can absorb those ex uh, extra costs within its existing baseline funding. So to secure our ongoing supply of medicines, the government has approved an extra $74 million in funding for Pharmac this year, and an extra $76 million in funding for Pharmac next financial year. That's on top of the almost quarter of a billion dollars in extra funding that Pharmac has received over the last 12 months. I'm also announcing today an extra $30 million will go to the National Close Contact Service that was established earlier this year. Contact tracing is one of our key lines of defence against COVID-19, and it's vital that we continue to build our capacity. This investment includes more funding for surge capacity and information technology. It also supports the ongoing development of the COVID-19 Tracer app. At the same time, we're also investing in a new national immunisation solution so that when, COVID when a COVID-19 vaccine is eventually developed, we're ready to roll out a mass vaccination programme. We can't afford to wait for the vaccine to be available. We need to start work now to replace the current national immunisation register. <clears throat> we're also investing more in our hospital infrastructure to support the use of ventilators in the event of an outbreak. We currently have 348 more ventilators on order, with delivery due by the end of the year. And we've got order orders for more than 1,000 respiratory machines. 230 of those have already arrived. All of that life-saving equipment needs the right infrastructure to support it. So $35 million will be used to purchase more oxygen supplies and the necessary uh, gear to ensure that that oxygen is delivered at the right pressure. There's also more money for telehealth services, which continue to deal with high volumes of calls, and a further $50 million for PPE. All of these investments will build on our strong response to the global pandemic to date. So I'll now ha hand you over to Dr Bloomfield, who will provide you with an update on today's numbers, and of course what is happening with testing. Thank you, Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, today there's just one new case of COVID-19 to report, <coughs> and this case is in managed isolation. It's now been 81 days since the last case of COVID-19 uh, was acquired locally from an unknown source. Today's case is a woman in her 30s uh, who arrived in the country last Thursday from London via Doha and Sydney. She was staying at the Novotel Ellerslie, tested positive at the routine day three testing and is now in the uh, quarantine facility in Auckland. So our number of active cases in New Zealand is 27. Uh, and there is no one in New Zealand who requires hospital level care at the moment for COVID-19. Our total number of confirmed cases is now 1,205. Uh, yesterday our labs processed 1,007 tests. The seven day rolling average therefore is 1,984 and our total to date is 444,176. Uh, 
Just a quick couple, a couple of comments on why these uh, rates of testing are low at the moment. It's, uh, I think, a combination of at least three things. First of all, our surveillance shows that the rates of influenza-like illness are low in the community, uh, and that is almost certainly a result of the lockdown that we went into right at the time when influenza viruses would have been coming into the country and they haven't spread in the community. So the rates of influenza-like illness on our surveillance through both um, our surveillance through practices and through the Health Tracker app are um, around 10 to 20 per cent of what they usually are at this time of year. The second thing is we always see a drop off in testing uh, during school holidays and at weekends and likewise uh, we have had feedback that a lot of people are actually declining the offer of a test. So this morning I led a roundtable discussion with clinical leaders from the College of General Practice, uh, Urgent Care, Emergency Medicine and the clinical leader from Healthline about increasing the amount of community-based testing for people with respiratory symptoms. Uh, we were all extremely conscious of and motivated by the situation Melbourne and Victoria now find themselves in. Small breaches there have led to extremely serious consequences and the health system in Victoria, healthcare workers and the wider public are now at renewed risk. We obviously want to avoid that situation here and testing remains a fundamental part of our overall response and everybody has a role to play here. We need to make sure that we detect any possible cases of COVID-19 in the community as quickly as possible. So following that discussion, there are three areas of action underway. First of all, later today, those colleges will be sending a message out uh, to their members uh, with a survey on uh, issues that they may have that could be presenting barriers to offering testing, but that message will confirm that swabs should now be offered to all people who present in general practice to an urgent care facility or in the ED who have respiratory symptoms. They will be surveying their members, as I said, to make sure they have the resources they need to identify any barriers to offering testing so that we can then address those barriers. The second area of focus is working with the district health boards to ensure testing remains widely available, including at general practices and community-based assessment centres, and that is, it is accessible to the population, including on the weekends. We also need GPs to be confident that they will be paid if they do a COVID-19 swab on anyone. And I, I can reiterate the message here that swabbing is free at the point at which it is done. This brings me to the third area of action and that is where all New Zealanders have a role to play. If you are offered a swab, then please take up that offer. It is a fundamental part of our overall approach and strategy to getting ahead of COVID-19. And uh, just some comments on testing at the border. We uh, have a program now well underway to test people working in managed isolation facilities or quarantine. This includes both the hotel staff and other staff seconded in, for example, those providing health services or security or managing uh, the facility. Uh, the program provides additional assurance that we are continuing or that we will detect and contain COVID-19 at the border. It's in addition to testing of all people working at the border who develop any symptoms, which has been a mainstay right through and well, well established. I do want to thank the range of employers who are making their staff available uh, for that testing and to those who are working at the border for being part of that very important surveillance program. DHBs and the providers who are providing that testing are reporting to us on a weekly basis over the numbers and I can say that between the 8th and 19th of July 405 people working in managed isolation facilities or at the border have been tested to date and that testing now continues on a regular basis. Finally, the New Zealand COVID tracer has now recorded 616,300 registered users and there are 80,130 posters that have been generated. And I just want to give a plug once again for people to uh, download and register and use the app to keep a, a track of where they have been to assist in speedy contact tracing uh, should that be required. Thanks, Minister. All right, now happy to open up for questions. Yes. What feedback have you had about the reason people are uh, rejecting the offer? Uh, so uh, I think there are a couple of reasons here. The first is people uh, see that there is no, and the message the Minister's just given it again, is that we're very confident there's no community-based transmission. So they 
on one hand feel um, uh, confident about that and it's a great position to be in and so they then think well I don't necessarily need a swab and the, I think that's the main reason. The point I do, uh, or the second reason actually is that the nasopharyngeal swab can be quite unpleasant and so we have said to our practitioners that they can, if people would prefer, they can just do the throat swab. It still needs to be done correctly, but if it is, it's almost as sensitive as the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, so I think uh, here again is just to reiterate to people that we're not doing the testing for nothing. It is a, an absolutely fundamental part of our strategy and uh, what we don't want to be is in a situation like Melbourne where just a few cases out there quickly escalated into a widespread outbreak. We need to identify them early and the way to do that is to ensure we are testing widely people with symptoms. Okay. about testing staff on a regular basis, what exactly does that mean? Well, it, uh, we're just working out the details of that. It will be depend on which setting they are working in and what the likely exposure they would have to people who may have COVID-19, that is people coming into the country. So uh, it may be that it's weekly, fortnightly, or three to four weekly, and we're just working out for different groups what the right interval will be for that. We're getting advice on that today. So it won't be sort of at random as far as staff goes? No, it will be a regular program of testing. And ongoing, yes. Do you have any data on how widespread refusals might be? I don't at this point in time, and that's one of the questions that the colleges are surveying their members around, and we should have that information back later this week. It may be early next week before it's been collated, and I can then report that to you. But yeah. Yeah. was there a sense when you were meeting with people earlier about the scale of it? Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't really have a, an idea of, the, of how to quantify that. Did you, drop off in testing, do you think the drop off in testing numbers is because the messaging over the criteria for who should be tested has changed a number of times over the last couple of weeks and people are confused? Uh, not necessarily. I think that that probably hasn't helped. I think there's also, you know, it's the last day of school holidays over the over the weekend. We do see a lower lower. We saw a downturn in the last school holidays. We saw a, we we typically see a downturn in the weekends. Um, so I think that the outline, the the measures that are being put in place now to get those numbers back up again are very important. Um, but a, a, you know, a really important message to stress again to New Zealanders is if you're offered a test, take one up. Um, we are asking everybody to do their bit here to make sure that. If there is any COVID-19 in the community that we pick it up. So we're not doing this just as a nicety. This is actually a really important part of our response to COVID-19. We've got to keep vigilant, stay vigilant, and make sure that we're keeping it out of the community. An announcement late last month that people with cold and flu symptoms no longer had to get a test. Do you think that should never have been made? Oh, look, I think um, one of the things that uh, I guess the health system as a whole would have been conscious of is that as we come into flu season, uh, we didn't want to be completely swamped with a bunch of testing that wasn't necessary if we didn't have community transmission. But we still need to have a sufficient level of testing to ensure that we don't have community transmission. So getting that balance right is important. The balance, uh, as I indicated last week, the balance has swung too far one way. We're not getting enough testing now. So we've got to, we've got to correct and we've got to push back so that we are getting the level of testing that we need. Okay. So, what is a little bit more detail about what this national immunisation sort of uh, update will, will look like? So we do have an immuni a national immunisation register at the moment. Um, um, my understanding, the advice that I have received is that um, it wouldn't necessarily be able to cope with a mass immunisation programme. So there's, an IT, there's some IT work that's needed there around getting that um, that register uh, into a, a, a more robust form. It's a legacy system, so you know, if from time to time you do need to update these IT systems. So we're going to get on and do that work. That'll mean that we're well positioned when we're in a position to do a, a mass vax campaign um, to use that as the as the platform to do that. And the COVID tracer sort of <coughs> registrations went up last week for a little bit, but now they've again sort of fallen to that same flat line. Is there any update on, on whether businesses are going to be required to put up QR codes or any other measures you're going to be? So I've received some further advice on that uh, late last week. I haven't had a chance to go through that, and I obviously then have to go back to Cabinet if there's future decisions required on that. Um, so I'll be working through that over the coming week. In the meantime, though, um, every New Zealander um, has the power to download the app now. And I also want to say to the business community, a lot of the business community are saying, we're really happy with the space we're in now because we've got so much freedom back. How can we assist? 
how can we make sure we stay in this positive space that we're in now? And they can do that by encouraging their customers to take up the COVID app and to be using the COVID app and to make sure they do the display in the QR code. So that's something that businesses can help us with. They can help to communicate that message as well. Have you ever seen an organisation solution? It makes it sound like uh, rather than just a, it's like you're working on an actual vaccine or something like that. So it's just, it's not, how do I put this? <laughs> Can you explain to us how it works, what it's going to do, and what actually, what efforts are being under, undertaken in relation to a vaccine? Well, as, as you'll be aware, there's a lot of work going on around the development of a vaccine here in New Zealand and around the world, and, and Dr Woods um, is, has already outlined what the New Zealand government is doing to back the research around vaccine development, um, and you're welcome to put further questions to her on that. The bit that I have been interested in, and the health system of course is interested in, is once we have a vaccine, how quickly can we get it to people? How quickly can we administer it so that we build up, you know, we, so that the, it can work as intended? Um, because the sooner we're in the position to do that, um, then the, the, the sooner we're in a position to start opening up again. We don't want to wait until we've got a vaccine before we start to figure out how we're going to actually administer a vaccination campaign. We want that ready to go so that as soon as we've got a vaccination, we can get underway and do that. But I, I don't know whether Dr Bloomfield wants to add to that. Thanks, Mr. Just a couple of extra comments. The reason um, we're using this term solution is because it's based off the um, uh, information uh, program, uh, information technology we've put in underneath the bowel screening program, which is called the National Screening Solution. And that is now providing a platform on which we can um, put other key public health programs. The first one of those is we've used that um, platform to build up the national contact tracing solution, so it's the same underpinning technology. And likewise, the next iteration of the National um, Immunisation Register will sit on that same IT platform. And a couple of the things that it provides that are immediately helpful for even our routine immunisation is a wider range of uh, practitioners will be able to enter data into it about when they immunise people. We had to make a, a, a rapid change last year during the measles outbreak to allow pharmacists to do this. This will allow, for example, people to enter information if they give a, uh, an occupational health nurse, give someone an influenza um, uh, a vaccine um, out in their workplace. So it provides a sort of a wider range of functionality that is not just about recording vaccinations, but actually allows overall management of that immunisation program. And that will be fundamental to our ability to rapidly roll out a wide vaccination program uh, if or when a vaccine is available for COVID-19 at the bottom of the list to get a vaccine from around the world or have we kind of ramped up a little bit Look, I wouldn't say that we're at the bottom of the list. Obviously, New Zealand's doing its part around you know the international research effort to ensure that a vaccine is developed. Um, those de those decisions are a long way away at this point. Um, so the medicines have gone up sort of seventy percent in price, and Pharma relies on what is it, a sole supply arrangements. Are you sure that they're getting the best price available for these? Well, look, that is one of the strengths of the Pharmac model. It is that, you know, through the bulk purchase arrangements that Pharmac can put in place, we do tend to get a very competitive price for our pharmaceuticals. And actually, um, I have, you know, before COVID-19, travelling around the world um, as a politician, can tell you that we are, that Pharmac, our Pharmac system is the envy of many other countries around the world when they look at the price they pay for their pharmaceuticals compared to what we are paying for it. They actually think that we've got a very, very good and robust system here. So, um, you know, I think success of New Zealand governments um, have jealously guarded farm, the Pharmac model and will continue to do that because it does result um, in a wider range of healthcare being available to New Zealanders than if we had a you know open slather as other countries do. The, um, the result of the price rise is sort of the global shortage and demand for it rather than the model that Pharmac is operating to? Uh, no, I think I mean the, the, the price um, the price increase is a, a part of a a global supply chain challenge. Um, you don't just see this in pharmaceuticals, you'll see it in other, in other fields as well. Pharmaceuticals, PPE, medical devices, they're not immune to the fact that um, you know, there, is, there are some global supply chain issues at the moment. On the testing, so with the sort of broadened testing regime, um, is there going to be any more transparency of who is being tested? So workers um, in the community, 
and people who are in managed isolation, because it's very tricky to get it at the moment. One of the things that I've, I've said, and um, I'll, I'll um, get the DG to give you an update on where they're at with this, is I want to see, on a daily basis, when we get the daily testing results, a breakdown of which of those tests are coming from the community, which are coming from MIQ facilities. We do that part now, but I want a separate reporting line for uh, testing of staff at the border. So at the moment, their systems are being put in place to allow that to happen, but I don't know whether... Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Update. And we're, we're working a pace on that. Uh, we will then uh, publish those results, and usually when we speak to them, we talk about how many were done at MIQ facilities of the total, and we will be able to provide a table with a breakdown each day of just where the testing from the day before was um, uh, conducted. From uh, vaccines for Dr. Bloomfield, um, what do you make of the new University of Oxford vaccine reported in the Lancet today? Oh, look, I think it's it's hugely encouraging. Again, it's a first step, but uh, to have uh, a vaccine trialled in a reasonable sized cohort of people and showing an immune response is very encouraging. And I think the thing that I took most from that was a researcher, at, in a sense, uh, who's uh, um, uh, part of a, a rival initiative in another part of the UK was speaking very positively about that and I think the key thing in this effort is that knowledge that has been gained has been and, and the results have been published early so that then is available to inform all others who are also researching vaccines so this is a very promising start the next phases of course are also important with um, following those people up to see how long the immune response lasts and also testing it for safety and efficacy in a larger group of people I will just have a, just have a couple more questions because I know it's a house sitting day and people who have other places they need to be. Do you want to do a quick follow up on that? Just one quick follow up. Um, the UK has already ordered 100 million doses of, of that vaccine. So is New Zealand working to procure as well? Uh, well, not specifically of that vaccine, but what I can s say is that uh, New Zealand has a number of irons in the fire in the vaccine area and I know um, that and the Minister's referred to this and Megan Woods has as well, Minister Woods, that actually um, there is further um, advice coming to the government about where it needs to invest additionally in sort of um, pre-market pre, um, commitments on a whole range of vaccines. Uh, even because even those that might be showing early promise may not end up being the, the best candidate vaccine right at the end of the process. So I think um, having uh, our efforts spread across both a range of possible vaccines but also working collaboratively with other countries and other international partners is the way to go and that's the approach we're taking. Okay. Just, just, so that just 300 or so um, ventilators have arrived in the country. So how many ventilators do we have at the moment, including those ones that have arrived, and how are you making decisions about where they go? Uh, look, I haven't got the numbers, the, the exact numbers. I know that we managed to increase our numbers of ventilators, you know, from, from when we first started. I don't, don't know if you know the number off the top of your head. But I, I don't have the updated yeah. number, and we will provide that. Yeah. Uh, however, I, what I can say is we are now have a group looking at where those new ventilators should be distributed to make sure we have got them uh, in the right place around the country. Yeah. On the central location, or are you looking at distributing them immediately to DHBs? Uh, we would distribute them out, and of course they are something that can be relocated um, quite readily if needs be to different regions. Yeah, last question. A question for the sports team um, ahead of the rugby match this weekend. How does it feel being in the scrum alongside a former All Black, a Hurricane and a Samoa International? <laughs> Well, I think I've been set up by Ken Laban, who's organised this, because I said I'd have a short run on the wing, and I've been listed at number seven. And I'm greatly privileged to be uh, in a forward pack alongside Rodney Sayolo, Jason Eaton and Norm Hewitt, but I'm not sure how long I will last on the field. Thank you. If you had a rugby nickname, what would it be? Uh, I haven't thought about that, but my comms team are coming up with some options, so maybe Thursday I can uh, divulge that closer to match day. Minister, are you concerned at all about someone trying to put a big tackle in on the Director-General? Uh, look, I, I, th I think he'll be able to look after himself. Thanks.